They took away our afternoon coffee and tea, didn't they? So uh, you'll just have to get uh, drunk on knowledge um, to stay awake and involved in all of this. Uh, this is the last presentation I have to do today. I'm going to be talking about material design. Uh, my name is Scott Davis. I run a consultancy out of Denver, Colorado called Thirsty Head. This is what I do. I do HTML5 development and have focused on mobile for quite some time. I also do a lot of smart TV development. What's interesting, our smart, TV, smart TVs are much like mobile web development in that you have alternate UIs. With smart TVs, you have remote controls to get there. With phones, you have big fat meat sticks on the end of your hands to interact. But all of these are interesting ways to do web development. And material design caught my attention. Because as we're doing web development, as we're doing these kinds of things, we're always looking for things that will get us to market sooner. Things that we can use out of the box that will speed our time to market. And so I was excited about material design. And I went to the material design website and I looked for downloadable code. And I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I couldn't find it. As a matter of fact, if you go to Material Design website, what you will find is a manifesto. You'll find hours of reading material talking about the philosophy of material design, but no material design. And you say, wait a second. What is all this hype? What's all this excitement about? Because if I go to getbootstrap.com, how many of you here use Twitter Bootstrap? The very first thing you see right there is download bootstrap, right? So material design and bootstrap are very similar. I'll spend a lot of time talking about them back and forth. But one thing I want to make very, very clear is that Twitter bootstrap is an implementation. Yeah? And material design is a design philosophy that has many different implementations. So that's why if you do your initial search on Google Material Design and go and do that, they've done a really nice job of talking about what their philosophy is, what their design philosophy is. They say we challenged ourselves to create a visual language. And I say, aha, language. What language did you use? JavaScript? You use JavaScript? And they say, no, 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 no. No, this is a visual language that involves paper elements. That's our metaphor, our paper elements. Paper elements that have lighting and shadows and edges. And again, while it's very interesting, you keep saying to yourself, but what about the download? How do I use this myself, right? Well, we're going to talk about that. We really will. I will give you several implementations of material design that you'll be able to download at the end of this presentation. But like all my presentations, it's important for me to know that you understand both the semantics and the syntax. So we'll spend the first half of this presentation talking about the philosophy and why material design should be interesting to you. And then we'll spend the latter half talking about the different implementations that, yes, you can download and use out of the box. So if you're looking for a download button, give me about 20 minutes and I'll show you the download button, OK? So one of the things that you have to realize is that Twitter Bootstrap introduced us to the idea of responsive web design, right? A single web page that will respond to the size of the device that it's on. So if you use Twitter Bootstrap, your web page will look equally well on a four inch device like a smartphone. It'll look just as good on a nine inch device like a tablet or a 15-inch device like a laptop, or a 60-inch device like a smart TV. We call that responsive web design because it's one website that responds to the device that it's on and adapts itself accordingly. That doesn't change. We still get responsive web design with material design. 
but you will notice that it uses slightly different language. On Twitter, Bootstrap will say, we'll make your website look good across all browsers. And that's important. But at Material Design, when they're talking about their design philosophy and paper and lighting and animation and all that, they say over and over again that we're trying to develop a single underlying system that allows for a unified experience across platforms as well as device sizes. And this is the first important but very important distinction between material design and Twitter Bootstrap or any other solution like this is that we're moving beyond a cross browser solution to give us a cross platform solution. How many of you thought this was going to be an Android talk? Several of you raised your hand. Yes, absolutely. I was talking to my colleagues um, over lunch, and they are all iOS developers. So a lot of them, you know, say, oh, yeah, 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 that's that whole Android thing, right? And I say, well, you know, is anyone talking about material design in iOS? I say, no, 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 not really, all right? Because with iOS development, the look and feel and the component set is kind of baked into the platform. If you develop an iOS app that doesn't use the existing widget set and doesn't use the existing user design guidelines and things, it looks odd, doesn't it? So there is one um, prevailing philosophy, and there, there's some merit to this, that, yeah, iOS apps should look like all the other iOS apps, and Android apps should look like all the other Android apps, and Windows apps should look like Windows apps and Mac apps should look like Mac apps. And, and there really are strong design considerations for that. When you open up an application like Microsoft Office on a Macintosh, it's gotten better and better over the years. They've progressively made it feel more and more native to the Mac platform, but it always felt like a Windows app that you were running on a platform. It felt like a stranger in a strange land. And so one design philosophy is to adopt to your platform, make it feel like it belongs on this platform. And another design philosophy, of course, is pixel perfect design across all platforms. Well, material design isn't just an Android story. It could be saying, oh, well, yeah, if you're using material design, it's to make Android apps that feel like they belong on the platform. And while that is the case, while that is one particular use case for material design, you'll see that you can use material design on your .NET apps as well. And so all of a sudden, you're crossing platforms. You can have an Android app that looks like a .NET app. And then in addition to .NET, we're going to give you several examples of how you can bring material design to the web. So you can have your browser app look like your Android app look like your .NET app. So there are two different options out there. There is no major consensus in the industry. Some people like having a platform specific look and feel. I typically go that route myself. I feel like if I'm on my iPhone, that app should feel like it's on an iPhone. But I mentioned this in my previous presentation that I'm working for a company and I'm the chief web architect for a company called QSC. Dot com and we have desktop apps and we have browser apps and we have apps that run on uh, hardware hardware that might touch screens that might sit on a conference room table or be on the wall or things like that and so we really do for our particular app for branding purposes for things like that we are favoring the same look and feel across platforms which is what drew us to material design Now, when it comes to being able to download material design and use it, Polymer, believe it or not, is a really good resource for you. Polymer is one implementation that uses material design, and specifically the paper elements 
in Polymer. So if you're looking for a downloadable implementation of material design, these Polymer components are a really strong set of candidates. That's not the only one I'll show you today, but this is one that we've been using in our application, and we really like it because now we have a series of components form input fields and dialog boxes and menus and things like that that have a particular look and feel and that look and feel crosses platforms which we really like but what we have to do is be very clear about what parts of that are polymer the implementation and what parts of that are material design the design language but i've mentioned components in many of my talks today. That is absolutely one of these web trends that I think you ignore at your own peril. Because most of the web frameworks I'm seeing these days are addressing components or one way or the other. Whether you're a React programmer or an Angular programmer or AMP as we saw earlier today or Polymer, these are all web components. And so it is helpful at least having one reference implementation that you can look at to get a feel for what we're talking about. And that's what Polymer offers you. These are a set of downloadable, out-of-the-box comp components that you can just begin using. So for instance, if I were to go to Polymer, Polymer, come on, there we go. So if we were to go to Polymer right now, one of the things they have, come on back, one of the things they have is a set of elements. A set of elements that you can just go and download and begin using out of the box. Now, they use this uh, um, uh, element table metaphor, which is really kind of fun. So you have app elements, which are the base, base level elements. There are very few of them there. They aren't very interesting because they're so low level. Most of the elements you're going to use are going to derive that lowest level set of elements, those app elements. The next level up are iron elements. And while these are um, elements that you'd expect, like dialog boxes and tabbed interfaces and buttons and text input fields and text areas and things like that, they are unstyled. So these iron elements are very rough hewn elements. And you can turn around and apply your own style to them if you'd like. Or, or you could download a paper element, which are material design look and feel applied to iron elements. Does that make sense? Yeah? So if you want to use these iron elements, that's great, but you'll be able to apply your own style to them. If you like this material design that we're talking about, well, you can go in here and begin looking at some of these paper elements all on your own. For instance, if you wanted to have a paper dialog box come up, this is what we're dealing with. Web components are all about being able to create your own HTML elements. So you'll see right there, we have a paper dialog element. This is a web component, and this is valid syntax. This is what HTML5 web components brings to the party. Now again, I'm trying to be very clear that this is a set of web components that has the material design look and feel applied to it. But this is just the first implementation of material design we'll show you. There are several other we'll show you along the way as well. But for right now, all you have to realize is, oh, hey, look, I've got a paper dialog. And here is the content, and as you can tell, it's scrollable. And then they have some buttons, and as you can tell, they do very specific things. But what I like most about this is not only can we read the fine documentation, we can also turn around and see live demos of these kinds of things. So I can come in here right now and see a plain dialog pop up, or I could see a modal dialogue that gives us that nice light shade behind the scenes. I can see a dialogue with drop downs. So you begin seeing here all the various versions of this dialogue we can have and they're giving you the actual source code that you can play around with it. 
So if you want to begin using these kinds of things, if we go back and read the fine documentation once again, um, actually this is what I was looking for right here, they give you the command I just need a text editor. I don't care which one. Let's see, how about Sublime? There we go. That's a first world problem, isn't it? Trying to decide which version of a text editor you want to use. All right, so, oh my goodness, come on now. There we go, that's all I wanted so I could zoom this in so you could see what's going on. So anytime you want to use any of these elements, all you'll simply do is Bower install them. And the most important thing about these web components, modulo, material design, or otherwise, is that they are fully encapsulated. So when I bow or install this paper dialog, if it has transitive dependencies, they'll come along for the ride. If it has JavaScript and CSS needs, and it will, that will come along for the ride as well. And so all you do is start using that paper dialog and all of its dependencies and requirements will come along for the ride. And while we're using fairly arbitrary examples like dialogues and tapped, interfa uh, tapped interfaces, some people get kind of excited about this when we move a little bit further up the food chain and start demonstrating Google components. Because there are things like a Google map component that you can begin adding. Now, have any of you done any Google Map development in the past? Yeah, even just a little bit, even just Hello World, yeah. So you remember how you did it, right? You brought in the Google Maps library through a script source, and then you brought in CSS through a link rel equals style sheet, and then you created a div, probably named it with an ID of map, and you imperatively, as a programmer, tied all those various resources together. I alluded to this earlier in my mean to architecture, but everything about that was pathologically global. What you did was you loaded all of those Google Maps libraries into the global namespace. And you loaded all that CSS into the global namespace. And you had one big DOM that was shared by all of that. And your DOM is really kind of like one big shared global variable, isn't it? If jQuery can come in and sweep it and make a bunch of changes, and then Backbone can come in and sweep it and make a bunch of changes, and then your code can come in and sweep it and make a bunch of changes, yeah. There's a reason why we don't use global variables anymore, isn't there? It's really hard to figure out who's making changes to your bits. And the same has been true for web development all this time, but we didn't bring it up because we didn't have another option. So in Google Maps, the previous way to do it, you had all this global imperative code trying to tie together what you really wanted to be was this independent web component of Google Map. Now, look what we can do. We've got our own Google Map element with our own custom attributes like latitude and longitude. And inside of that, we have a Google Map marker, and that can be draggable or not. And so you begin seeing we're snapping together declarative pieces of code rather than wiring together imperative global libraries. And if you don't need a Google Map, well, perhaps you'll need a YouTube element. You can have a Google YouTube element that'll just take that unique ID off the URL, whatever ID you have up in, in uh, YouTube that identifies that video, you can drop this in and declaratively then you'll have a Google Map video element that might autoplay, that might be uh, full screen enabled, that might be all number of things. And if you don't want a YouTube video, well then you might want um, a, uh, a Google chart or a Google calendar or any number of things. So we kind of got off track a little bit there. It's okay, I don't blame you. That was a joke. I don't blame you at all, but I find that it's really hard to talk about this design language, material design, without having a good idea of web components. Now these are two separate ideas, but as you'll find, it's really hard to talk about one without talking about 
the other. So what you saw now was one implementation of a set of web components. And through these paper elements, we were able to have a downloadable, executable set of web components that just happened to be styled using material design. Does that make sense? Yeah? Outstanding. All right. Because here's another implementation you can begin using. If you like that Twitter bootstrap experience of downloading some JavaScript and downloading some CSS and styling up your elements with traditional CSS classes, well then you can use Material Design Lite, MDL. And just like you go to getbootstrap.com to, well, get bootstrap, yeah. You go to getidlmdl.com to, well, get Material Design Lite. But to be very clear now, now we're seeing two implementations. One is a set of encapsulated web components. Another one is a JavaScript library and a CSS library that you can pull down and begin using on your own. So let's talk a little bit more about the design philosophy, and then we'll go back to these implementations. Because we're all developers here. We like implementations. We like code examples. I do as well. But material design, once again, when it was being developed, it was codenamed quantum paper, which sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? And their design metaphor was paper. If you look at some of these widgets over here, you'll see everything is very flat. It looks like paper, but it does have some shading. We'll see that these are pieces of paper that are stacked onto each other. And so as you increase the zoom level of these things, the shadow gets more involved. But more than anything else, this should feel like pieces of paper you're moving around on the screen. The designer, Duarte, said, unlike real paper, though, this is quantum paper. This is magic paper. This is paper that stretches and expands and reorders itself intelligently. It is material that has physical physicality to it. It has edges to it. It feels like actual components that you're shuffling around on the screen. But this Metaphor is still based on kind of a paper and ink uh, uh, design philosophy as well. So anytime you're hearing people talk about paper, just like the paper elements in uh, uh, polymer, it's because we have this paper metaphor floating through. And this paper metaphor wasn't chosen lightly. Because it was a direct reaction to, ah, yes, skeuomorphism. How many of you were doing iOS development around iOS 6 and 7? Do you remember those changes? Yeah. Are we still fighting about it? Do you miss the rounded buttons and the lens flares and the 3Ds and everything? I kind of do. I kind of do, but you can't fight City Hall on that kind of thing, do you? I mean, definitely the trend these days are for these kinds of flat designs. So what does this mean exactly? Well, you can tell in a heartbeat just by looking at it, one of those is definitely not flat, right? The calculator on the left feels like a calculator. Those look like they're buttons. They look like they have depth. They have lens flares and lighting and shading and all kinds of things going on. Again, I don't hate that interface. You know who else didn't hate that interface? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was a big fan of this skeuomorphic look and feel. You know who is not a good big fan of the skeuomorphic look and feel? Johnny Ives. Exactly. And so this is the internal battle within Apple, writ large right here, or writ small on the screen, as it were. But all the way up through iOS 6, we had the former, and from iOS 7 and beyond, we have this new flat. And I will agree that it's a very clean aesthetic. It looks very modern. It looks very paper-like, doesn't it? Even though that's not material design at all, that's the iOS look and feel to it. But again, you'll see similarities between these frameworks. 
And more importantly, though, than the look and feel is the design philosophy behind it. Skeuomorphism is when you make computer objects, digital objects, look like they're real world analogs. And sometimes that can be very effective and sometimes it kind of looks like wood panels on a, on a car, right? Because what they were trying to do is say, oh, remember that horse-driven buggy uh, uh, bug, uh, carriage uh, that we used to have? The horse and buggy is what I was trying to get out there. Do you remember the horse and buggy? Wouldn't it be cute if our car looked like a horse and buggy? How many of you have ever been in a horse and buggy? Yeah, oh, a couple of you have. Okay, great. Grew up on the farm. Yeah, I'm a Nebraska boy myself. I've been on a farm. Yeah, I've been on those kinds of things. But I don't need my car to harken back to bygone eras where we used to have horse-driven carriages that were made of wood, so we need our new modern car to echo that previous generation's technology. Do you see what I'm saying there? It's more than a look and feel, it's just a real design philosophy. And we have skeuomorphism not in terms of look and feel, but we have these older callbacks throughout our industry. How many of you have ever used a floppy disk in your life before? Yeah, that's right. My son looked at me and says, why do we always click on that square to save things? And I said, well, son, it's going to be a long story. You better sit down. <laughs> right? Here's one that I love. You've probably recognized those bottom examples there as radio buttons. But how many of you remember car radios where you would push in one button and the rest of them would come out? Yeah, not many hands go up there, did they, right? Yes, some but not many. So that is another great example of a callback to a bygone era. My first car had an 8-track player in the, in, the, in the dashboard as well, right? I remember these radios visually, so for me, it's a great metaphor. When it, people say radio buttons, it's like, oh, I get it, that it's for mutually exclusive options. When you push one button in, the rest pop out. But does that metaphor resonate with <laughs> the other 95% of the world population right now that didn't have one of those radios in their dashboard growing up? That's, that's debatable. That's debatable. So once again, this flat metaphor says we're not trying to look like felt gaming tables or leather-bound notebooks, or calculators with round buttons. We have this very flat metaphor, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have depth. And I know that sounds like I might be talking out of both sides of my mouth, and I am. But what we're dealing with is a paper metaphor that has layers and lighting and shadow. If you look at that image on the left, can you correlate it to all the different paper elements on the right and see how that was assembled? This is both a design talk, but also a web components talk as well. We see those individual components, the bottom nav bar and the search bar along the top and various components being stacked up. All right. So material design really has kind of three golden rules. One is that it should feel like material, and the material we're talking about is paper. I've certainly uh, uh, rubbed your nose in that one long enough, haven't I? The other one is that it is really meant to be bold you'll see that the default background is white. Most of the buttons fade into the background, but if you have a particular action that you're trying to draw your eye to, it might be a largely white screen with one big yellow button up in the corner or one big red exclamation point drawing it to your attention. That's not a mistake either. It's meant to be a very subtle look and feel until it isn't. And so many people miss that. They start saying, well, my whole app needs to look like this. I like saying it looks like the Easter Bunny exploded, right? Does my whole app have to be these loud, garish colors? No, no, no. As a matter of fact, you should only have one 
maybe two loud garish colors on your screen at any given time because it's really meant to draw your eye to those particular actions. As a matter of fact, this kind of button, they call it a fob, which is a floating action button. And so those are the kinds of things that are really supposed to make it very clear what you're supposed to click on, what you're supposed to interact with on the screen. And the last thing we'll see, and this is very subtle, but this is what I like, is that iOS has this sense of gravity to it. What I love the most is when I'm in my Twitter client and I pull down to refresh, and do you notice how the screen starts pulling down fast but gets slower as you go? It's almost like it's got tension to it. It's almost like you're stretching a rubber band. And then when you let go, it kind of bounces back. That's something as iOS developers, we just take for granted that kind of animation, that motion is built into the platform. And if you start looking at web apps, they don't have that same sense of motion, that sense of gravity, that sense of physics over there. And what material design brings to the party is that sense of gravity and motion as well. Many of the buttons as you tap on them will give you a subtle little ripple effect. And again, it might look like it's just window dressing, but if you read the full design documentation, they say no, in the real world, when you tap things, they depress and come back in again. You slide things and they slow, start slowly and accelerate, or they de-accelerate at the end of these things. All of that kind of animation is built into this framework as well. So, there are a lot of fun things going on there. Even something as simple as this. When you go up to get MDL, they'll say, all right, why don't you do me a favor and pick a primary color and a secondary color? And you say, really? And they say, yeah. Rather than forcing you to style each individual element, you will define a bold primary color, typically a blue or a purple or a green or somewhere on that top side of the color spectrum. And then they ask you to provide a secondary color, something on the opposite end of that spectrum, typically a complementary color. And they did this in such a way that blue and yellow are opposite each other on that color wheel. So those two colors will work very nicely as a primary and secondary combination. Similarly, green and red will work really nicely together, not if you're colorblind, but if you do have sight and those kinds of things, green and red are complementary colors, blue and yellow are complementary colors. I like some of the more subtle ones, some of the subtle blues and subtle grays. So these are all things that I look for in a framework. I'm not a designer by trade, so anything that that framework can do to help me put together a professional looking color scheme is something that's very helpful as well. So we begin seeing once again that material design is a lot of things. We're going to show you the implementation. We're getting really close to showing you real code here. But again, this screen right here should kind of encapsulate everything we've talked about at this point. Material design takes a paper metaphor. It's not skeuomorphic. It is flat modern design, we have Z layering, we have shadows, and what we're seeing here, not only a bunch of pre-built components, but a pre-built components that are styled with a primary color and a secondary color, so what you end up with looks really professional. Any questions so far? No? Makes perfect sense? Outstanding. Well, let's start looking at some implementations. And I'm going to start with them. I've had bad microphone luck all weekend, haven't I? All week. All right. So what I was saying is now we are at the implementation part of this presentation. You've eaten all your vegetables. Now I get to serve you dessert. And so what we're going to look at is MDL first because originally I thought this would be what appealed to me the most because it is closest to the Twitter bootstrap experience. 
in that it's not web components at all. It's still very page-centric friendly, and you download a global JavaScript file and a global CSS file and begin styling up your elements. And so when I was looking to make my transition to bootstrap to material design, I thought for sure that this is what I was going to want because it most closely fit what I was doing with all my existing web development. You know what happened? I got really excited about web components. And I got really excited about ES6, and I got really excited about HTTP2, and I got really excited about this very new way of doing things. And so after we're done talking about MDL, I'm going to end up where I hope you will end up using this, which is going back to Polymer Elements, so you have all the benefits of the look and feel, but you have a strong component orientation as well. So that's where we'll end up. But let's talk about MDL. What is MDL? It's built to provide a lightweight and basic set of material design components. Now, they didn't say web components. So what they really should have said was, we wanted to provide a basic set of material design CSS classes that you can apply to any div or span in your current website. You probably would not use Bootstrap and Material Design Lite, you would probably use Bootstrap or Material Design Lite. But there's nothing stopping you from using both. So on one of my client projects, as we were trying to transition, they were using Bootstrap, and so we left Bootstrap in there, and we just brought in MDL because it was just another set of CSS files and JavaScript, and we started slowly transitioning from Bootstrap grids to Material Design Lite grids. And we started transitioning from bootstrap dialogues to MDL dialogues. So I do bring this up as that this is a great transitional technology, and it's certainly less radical than going full-on web components. This is a way where you could dip your toe in the water and begin gradually migrating over to this new look and feel. And these are good Google terms for you. If you want to do, uh, a lot of times, if you've got a library that you like, like let's say you're an Angular developer, I'll go into Google and I'll type in Angular versus and let it auto-complete for me all those options out of there. And so I encourage you to do things like that. Type in Twitter Bootstrap versus and you'll get an opportunity to see all the other libraries that are competing in that space and certainly MDL is one of them. All right. Can you hear me now? All right. So if you wanted to get started with Twitter Bootstrap, they say, here's all you have to do. You have to just kind of go in there and uh, download some CSS, download a little bit of JavaScript, put them in place, and then begin learning these various CSS classes. So this is what it ends up looking like. You'll download a bit of JavaScript. You'll download a bit of CSS. You can Bower install these things. I'm a big fan of Bower. And so Bower install Bootstrap is probably how I would get started with that. And then include the JavaScript and CSS that I needed. And then they're calling these things components. And I suppose in one sense of the word they are. But really, I've said this many times already, they're CSS classes that you apply to divs that make it look like you have this rich component set. We have all these available glyphs in here, but it's really just kind of an image source, isn't it? We have all these buttons and text fields, but when we have Twitter bootstrap buttons and text fields, they're just CSS classes that we're applying to existing HTML elements. And if there's not a good existing HTML element, you'll apply it to a div or a span to get your own component. And so here are some examples here. We've got a button, and it's going to look like a plain old HTML button unless you apply a class of BTN. Now, if you've been using Bootstrap for a while, like, oh yeah, that's Bootstrap. I recognize it. But if you didn't know this was Bootstrap, is there any way you could tell where that class is coming from? Yeah, probably not. And then it's kind of interesting as well because they have both button and button default 
in there. And you can kind of tell just by the name of those classes that they're somewhat related, but not always. And you'll just kind of arbitrarily start applying various CSS classes. So that span down below, it's not an image source. It's a span that has a glyph icon and a glyph icon exclamation sign in order to get that kind of stuff going. Again, nothing wrong with this. This is how web development has been since the beginning of time. You create an object in there, and then you apply a CSS class to it. So nothing wrong. Where it gets a little bit hairy, though, is when they start trying to do things like apply grids. Now, I love the Twitter bootstrap grid system in here. But when you start seeing it in implementation, you start saying, oh, well, these are various classes. One's an extra small column, and one's a small column, and one's a medium column, one's a large column. Again, nothing wrong with that, but you'll notice there's that dash after it. This is a 12-column layout. So you might have a three-column small, and then a five-column medium, and then a six-column large, and after a while that source code gets a little bit weird to look at. It starts building up and building up and building up. I love the functionality, but the user experience, when Scotty was talking about needing to be able to, to read your source code, and Laura was as well, you, we want to appreciate the aesthetics of our source code, not just our running app. I have a harder and harder time appreciating the aesthetics of my HTML as I begin adding more and more bootstrap classes to it. Because they begin building up and building up and building up. And while I love the functionality, it gets harder and harder to discern what's going on. So if you want to get started with MDL, it works the same way. They say you're going to include the master CSS and JavaScript. That's no different. You're going to start using the components, and that's no different. You will start using MDL classes on existing HTML elements. And if there's not a reasonable HTML element, you'll start using MDL classes on divs and spans. So in that sense, these are almost identical. You're just downloading a different set of style sheets and a different set of JavaScript. So in that sense, Bootstrap MDL, virtually identical as far as I'm concerned. Now, one of the things you'll begin finding interesting is one of the CSS files you'll download will have a bunch of colors already in there. You'll see material.something hyphen something, and those are the primary and secondary colors we talked about earlier. So it makes it very easy to swap out different looks and feels if you download material indigo pink and decide now what we really want is material green red or material blue, yellow, or blue, orange, or things like that. It makes it very easy for you to begin swapping out various look and feels in there. So that is one thing that's very different. You can do theming in Twitter Bootstrap as well, but it's not nearly as simple as this, as just swapping out the primary and secondary color in the name of the CSS file you'd like to download and start using. If you want to really customize your own, you do it. You go in there and click, try it out. And what you download at the end is your custom file that follows that naming convention. So in that sense, it's not too bad. In the sense of using components, it's not too bad. We'll see we've got cards and dialogues and layouts and loading and menu and sliders. Many of the things, it's not an exact one-to-one -one correlation between bootstrap components and MDL components, but they're close enough that you're going to recognize the similarity between the two. Now here's where it gets a little bit interesting. And what I thought was going to be one of my favorite features of this ended up really kind of pushing me more towards web components than I thought. Because let's take a look at some of these CSS classes that they're using. If you want to get this fab, this floating action button, here's how you do it. Well, you start with a button class, and then you apply MDL button to it. Oh, and then you also apply MDL JS button. And then you apply MDL button double dash fab. And then you add MDL button double dash colored. 
You say, wait a second, what's going on here? Now, in fact, the naming convention they're using there is a CSS naming convention called BEM. Are any of you familiar with BEM, B-E-M, in terms of CSS naming styles? No? Well, then you're in the right place. Because BEM is short for Block Element Modifier. And whereas Twitter Bootstrap did a fairly good job of beginning to cluster related CSS classes together, it was really more simple pattern matching than anything else. There really is a bit of philosophy behind how they named their elements. And this goes beyond MDL. You can use BEM, it's just a naming convention, in your own apps. But if you're already using it in your own apps, then you might be compelled to use MDL in your app as well. So what this means, block element modifier, means if you have a class like nav, well that's your block, that's your navigation block. And then if you look inside of that, well you have a bunch of items. Now here's the bummer, this is not BEM, this is just you creating your own classes. So you have a class called nav and then a class called item. Well, items fit inside of nav blocks, but you can't tell based on the way these classes are named. Oh, and then by the way, one of your navigation items can be active, almost like a radio button, right? But if you have just a class called active, is this an active button or an active navigation item or an active text field, right? And there's nothing wrong with these names. These are probably the names I would come up with if I were naming these on my own. But if we look at a BEM example, block element modifier, they typically give it a block with a dunder, a double underscore, to separate the block from the element, and then a double dash to separate the element from the modifier. So in our case, we still have a block named nav, but if we want to very visually associate all the items that belong in this nav block, notice how we've named them now. We've named them nav item. And then if you have an active name item, nav item, note we have here, we have a nav item active in there. So what initially looked very odd, I very quickly adopted. I liked this naming style because I could very quickly see any given class what the hierarchy is moving forward. That said, I still had a hard time falling in love with MDL menu, MDL menu button, bottom right, MDL JS, MDL ripple effect right? Because you ended up doing so much styling up on what was a simple element. This was simply screaming for a web component solution. This is where I wanted the encapsulation. This is how we started the talk. I wanted a Google map element, not a CSS element and a script source element and a generic div down there that I had to end up tying together imperatively. And even though I'm applying classes declaratively, it still was putting the onus on me to associate all of these classes with this particular arbitrary element. Does that make sense? Yeah. Nothing wrong with MDL. It's what I started with. It's what I thought, oh, this is going to be easy for me. But what I found was it was kind of a blue pill solution. It wasn't radical enough, and I wasn't embracing a radical solution for radical sake, but it didn't fit in with the predominant philosophy that's coming through web development these days, which is component orientation. And the benefit of web components is you drop a component into your web page declaratively, and it has all its own styling rules and behavior that come along for the ride. So that is where, when we took this move from MDL, it has some grid components like Twitter Bootstrap, but what I really began wanting was not applying classes to a div. I wanted to have components. So, what we're going to look at now is Polymer, 
which is a second implementation of material design. It shares the same look and feel, but this one is going to be a slightly more holistic approach. So Polymer is a Google project. It went 1.0 last summer. Last summer was a big summer. 2015, we got new HTML specs, new web component specs, new JavaScript specs, new HTTP specs, and yes, a new framework like Polymer, which now incorporates all of the web component aspects that are built into the platform, as well as, if you use the paper elements, a material design, very modern, flat, look and feel. So we've looked at these various elements, and yes, you can continue pulling down individual elements discreetly, but something that has changed most recently has really changed the way I look at Polymer, and that is this Polymer app toolbox. Because if you turn around and apply the toolbox, now all of a sudden you aren't dealing with a bunch of just free components rattling around that you can bring on, on your own. You actually have a set of command line tools that you can begin executing that give you a much more holistic experience. And apparently the demo gods have just now gotten angry with me. So all good presenters have canned examples already in place. I'm not a good presenter, but I have canned examples in place. And if you wanted to, you could go to, I'm in code, all right. Code local, and do I have my polymer? I do. So if you go out to, I would normally go out here. If you go out to the thirsty head GitHub repo, if you go to github.com slash thirsty head, you'll see these Polymer examples floating around. These were all installed through the Polymer toolkit. And if I make this a little bigger so you can see what the heck I'm doing, you'll see this Polymer toolkit ships with three sample apps that you can use. One of them is a simple application that you can use. Another one is giving you the ability to build out an individual component and then they have a shopping app that allows you to really see all of this stuff styled together. So in the uh, eight minutes we have together, we begin looking at what one of these elements ends up looking like. And this is essentially what it ends up looking like. You handle your dependencies among various Polymer components, not all web components, but Polymer, through the new link import spec. This is one of the four APIs associated with web components. You can create a custom element. You can deal with Shadow DOM. You have new template tags, and you have HTML imports. So if you're used to importing libraries in your Java classes and your C-sharp classes, your Swift classes, this should be the equivalent in HTML. You are bringing in the Polymer library and the Iron Icon library. In this particular example, you're saying, hey, I've got this Iron Icon, but I want to have some custom styling associated with it. I want to have a specific icon associated with it, and here's the script that handles the tap listener and the toggle and everything else. So in under 50 lines of code here, what I've done is I've been able to create my own Polymer element in a very, very natural way. Now, if you start putting elements together, well, then the next step would be to have an app and so if I show you the app example, so this Polymer Toolkit even ships with its own little dev web browser, so you don't have anything to worry about here. So localhost 8080, this is now what my sample app ended up looking like. I can have um, a tabbed interface where as we click through these various things, we have different elements. This is just a slider in this element just so we can begin playing around with these things. 
but we also begin seeing that we've got all of the things we would hope to have out of a responsive design as well. All of this is out of the box components. This is a polymer element that gives you this sidebar with the hamburger. So all you have to do in order to get that level of behavior, if we go looking up at build an app right here, our index.html simply brings in a my app element. And then your my app element ends up bringing in a number of other components like an app drawer and app scroll effects and things like that. But what you end up doing is declaratively begin building all these things up together. But what I really want to show you in the four minutes and 32 seconds we have left together is this finished app. Because at this point, you start saying to yourself, you start saying to yourself, self, oh, self, this is something I could get behind. This is an app that is completely client side. There's no server component associated with it. And these are all web components. So as we begin looking through various men's outerwear elements and say, oh yeah, I need me a good YouTube hoodie. As I click down in here, it's incredible to think that all of this is done client slot side declaratively with nothing but web components that you've begun snapping together. This is a very different way of doing web development if you're used to server-side Java-based web development or server-side C-sharp-based web development or even server-side JavaScript development. This is a code-first approach where you begin assembling web components declaratively rather than using code to imperatively bring all these things together. There's always going to be a little bit of JavaScript as we go along in here, but this Polymer Toolkit is something I encourage you to download and take a look at, and most specifically, that finished shopping app, because I think it very well might change your opinion on how mature web components are and how compelling it can be once you start using them yourself. But just like we've been talking about material design, it's easy to say that material design is web components. Web components is material design. I want to be very, very clear that you can do web components completely independently of material design. This is core browser technology right now. These four APIs, the customer element API, the HTML imports API, the templates, and the shadow DOM. This is well supported across all browsers. This slide is a little bit dated. Safari 10 is going to ship now native with um, Shadow DOM and template support in it as well. So we'll see a lot more green in that Safari column. Chrome and Opera have always had 100% support for these things. And Firefox has support for them behind developer flags. So all of this is in our browser right now, more or less. And the rough edges can be brought in through a polyfill library. Webcomponents.js is what you could bring in to do base level web component development in a browser. Of course, Polymer runs on top of Web Component JS, and your paper elements run on top of that. So all of these. Uh, concepts, web components are things that you need to be paying attention to because it's popping up in all of the major libraries. The browser support is there. It's no mistake that when you're doing Angular 2 development, you're defining your own components because this selector, hello world, is in fact the name of the element that you're creating. 
And so if you're doing Angular 2 development, you're doing component development. If you're doing Polymer development, you're doing component development. If you're doing plain old web component development, you're doing web component development. And this idea of material design being able to style up your web components is a very compelling story. So to end, because we are officially out of time, and these are all the live demos I just walked you through. Um, to end up here, Google Material Design is a design philosophy. And what's exciting about it is not only is it paper-based and bring animation and, and edges and shadows and things like that to this, it is a cross-platform solution. But this is a very modern way of styling your apps regardless of whether they're mobile apps, or tablet apps, or even desktop apps. Web components are one trend that are out there, and material design is one thing you can use with your web components to give them that really sharp, polished, professional, out-of-the-box look and feel. And that, my friends, is material design. Did you enjoy yourself? I did as well. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I appreciate it.